close.
and sing this out. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing great. so good. I want to read a passage from scripture. I have my big Bible with all my, I actually don't write notes in my Bible. I'm kind of weird. So there's no fancy colors or anything. But I love, I love this passage, like this translation of this passage. It's the um, NLT. And it really brings life to heaven. It uses words that I believe are so descriptive of heaven. And so earlier today, I was doing my devotion and I was going through this, um, just going through the Psalms because I love how the Psalms, so many of the writers are going through things. They're going through hard times and they're writing these Psalms and they're lifting up the name of Jesus while simultaneously saying, God, I need you. I need you right now. I can't do this on my own. And it's beautiful because that's what we do. That's why our praise is so special to God. It's different than the angels because the angels are with Jesus and they're in heaven and they're just circling the throne singing day and night, night and day, but they're not going through what we're going through. They don't have to deal with the effects of sin. And so when we come to the altar and we worship Jesus, and we glorify his name, we are dealing with sin, we're dealing with pain and suffering, and we're surrendering all of that at his feet when we worship him. So this passage, it says, it's chapter 84, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord with my whole being, body and soul, 
I will shout joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow builds her nest and raises her young at a place near your altar. O oh, Lord of heaven's armies, my King and my God, what joy for those who can live in your house, always singing your praises. And then it goes on and says, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. And then it says, I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. O oh Lord of heaven's armies, what a joy for those who trust in you. We trust in you, Jesus. We give you all of our trust, Jesus. Everything that we're going through, every worry that we have, every situation in our lives, Jesus, we give it all to you. Because better is it to spend one day in your courts, God. Better is it to be with our Father who gives us every good thing, who takes care of us like he takes care of the sparrow, God, like he takes care of the bird with the nest, Jesus. You take care of us. You're a good Father. So God, we come before you and we lay everything at your feet. We just want to worship you and spend time with you and be close to the altar. Jesus, we love you. Before 
Chapel. For those that are visiting, my name is Rob. I'm my honor and privilege to serve as the lead pastor here along with my wife, Rachel. We want to welcome you all. Tonight's going to be a little bit different night. Tonight is, um, we're going to take a break from our series that we've been in called Take Your Seat. And um, after the past several weeks and even uh, our past several services with Dr. Barallo, I wanted to share a message. Rachel and I were talking this week right from our hearts in that um, we had some conversations and I can remember, you know, as a little guy growing up, I grew up in church my whole life, and um, I can remember different guest ministers and different things happening in church, and, you know, if I didn't get a word or didn't get called out or didn't receive something maybe as demonstrative or as big as somebody else, I would look at it and be like, well, God, what about me? What about me? I'm struggling. I got stuff. So tonight I want to share a message with you. It's titled... Um, one in four. One in four. I know before you try to figure out what does he mean, what does he mean, it's not a, it's just a, a simple sermon title, but we're going to get into the message. You know, it's um, the past seven or eight weeks has been really powerful around here, what God has done. We've had services where, you know, the gifts of the Spirit have been in operation. There's been tongues and interpretation of tongues. There's been healings. Um, there's been people that have been filled with the Holy Spirit. There's been, um, you know, even the past couple of services with Dr. Varallo, there's been prophecy. There's been um, just different demonstrations, and that's just the nature and character of God on display for us all to see. But I want to encourage you in this. Um, as bodies were healed, as these things were happening, as there were salvations that were taking place, as there were impartations, as we would call it, of the Holy Spirit, um, our heart's desire is this is that you would grow in your relationship with God. Is that we want to have want you to have that exposure with all of these things and to get all that God has for you and to receive all that God has for you. But I want to keep encouraging you in your walk with the Lord. What we saw maybe Sunday and Monday night isn't always going to be the norm. How many like superhero movies? Adventure movies. So they're great. I love them. 
but sometimes we, we, the, the greatest thing that you can have in your life, if you receive a prophetic word, let me just say it like this. Know this is that it's almost like you're a target for the enemy. How many want to be a target? Exactly. Not for the enemy. So th- what the Lord has given us is a more sure word of prophecy called the Bible. Anything you find in the Bible is God speaking directly to you in any situation. Now you're going to have to break it down and ask for some wisdom. So God, I need wisdom from heaven because I'm in like Numbers and Leviticus. And I want to encourage you, don't go to Numbers or Leviticus. Go ahead and just start in the New Testament. Start reading. And like, God, what does this mean to me? What are you speaking to me? And that, you know, like Lindsay was sharing, even in the Psalms, is that there's different people struggling with different things. But at the end of the day, they're not casting their confidence aside. They're not casting their faith aside. They're saying that you are God. You are holy. You are true. You are right. And I'm still going to serve you regardless, even though I feel like this. As we, you've heard us share before, feelings are um, pretty little liars. They're pretty little liars. Don't let your feelings lead you. But as your pastors, Rachel and I, it's our desire simply this. For those that don't know Jesus, that you would come to believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And for those who have a relationship with Jesus, it's important for you to belong to a family. I grew up in a big Italian home. We always had one rule. There's always room for one more. So we always had one more at our house growing up. People uh, coming in and we had, you know, just at different times and we all had friends, we all had people, and my parents would be talking to people all the time. So we always had room for one more because it's important to belong to a family, a place where you can grow, a place to, um, where you can belong to, a church family where you can be loved and encouraged in your relationship with the Lord. Why? So you can become who God has destined and purposed you to become. You have a destiny, you have a purpose, you have a calling. You were made on purpose for a purpose. So think about that. Let that just rest in for a second. You have a destiny to fulfill, and that destiny, as you belong to a family of believers, means build the kingdom of God together. That's what we're doing. We're building the kingdom of God together. We all have a part to play. So tonight, I want to talk to you about making the most of the seeds that have been planted and sown in the services in the past and ones in the future. So how many have... um, your expectations a little bit high tonight. You, you, you want to hear from the Lord. You want to receive something from the Lord. All right. So whenever the Lord moves powerfully in a service, you have an enemy. We have an enemy. His name is Satan. He'll try to come to talk you out of believing what just happened, what was just imparted to you. The Bible says that the thief comes, but what? To steal, kill, and destroy. So nothing happens is what he's going to, nothing happens. There's no life change. There's no transformation. You're still the same you. That was a bunch of whatever. If someone made a decision to receive Jesus, then you go out and maybe you acted a certain way afterwards. Oh, nothing happened to you. That's still you. Look at you. Nothing changed. That was just empty words. Maybe you said something you shouldn't have said. The devil is going to try to accuse you. Maybe someone cut you off in traffic and you told them they were number one. <laughs> so, someone said twice. All right. That's it. The devil's going to say, you aren't saved. Nothing happened. But that's a lie. We just, you know, uh, a salvation, salvation and a salvation prayer isn't behavior modification. It's heart transformation. That God, you're, you're still working on me. I'm, 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 I'm a work in progress. I have some things to unlearn, some things to forget about it. And part of that is your past. Part of that is your past. So, or if someone came to get prayed and maybe you had pain, maybe you had some issues or some symptoms in your life, um, Satan might try to throw those symptoms back at you. Oh, nothing really happened to you. Oh, the pain left. You felt the change in your body. You felt the shift. And then maybe later on that night it came back, oh, nothing happened. That was just, you know, whatever. It's just weird. No, fight for your healing. Stand for your healing. That's something that Jesus paid for. He, he hung on that cross. He shed his blood so you can walk in divine health and healing and have peace. Or maybe if someone received a prophetic word, Satan might say, well, God loves that person more than you if you didn't. I've been in that situation before. I've been in that environment. 
but I believe that God does care about you. That you are important whether you received a, an open prophetic word or not. Because everyone in the room, everyone in the building can receive an impartation. And I believe that's what happened in our church family. So because you didn't get called out, don't think twice about it. Don't know God, no, God loves you, period. It's not affecting your destiny. So think about it. Let that settle in for a moment. Because I've struggled with that. I know what that feels like. As a little kid growing up, little kid, I'm thinking teenager, high school, whatever, little kid, sorry, that's you. <laughs> but I can remember all my friends, some of them, they, they had more giftings, more callings, more stuff. And I felt like the David in the backfield, the one that was overlooked. If you feel overlooked, if you feel left behind, if you feel like you're struggling, know this is that God sees you, God knows, and God's working. I want to share a story with you tonight. It's found in Matthew. And I want us to take a look, but I, 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 want, I want you really to, to listen with your ears tonight and listen with your heart. A few weeks ago, Rachel shared a message called One Thing. How many were here for that? That Jesus is our one thing. That was an awesome message. Our first priority and talked about keeping our hearts. It's important that you keep your heart. Yes, Lord, I'll get that. It's important that you keep your heart. As we shared before, why? Because out of it flows the issues of life. Keep your heart. There's a story. Anyone ever seen the movie Gettysburg? You don't have to raise your hand, whatever. <laughs> There's a scene the night before the main battle. The, the commanding general of the, of the Union Army, his name was George Meade. He comes out to the house where headquarters had been established, and he looks at one of his corps commanders and asks the question, is this good ground? Is this good ground? Is this the place to have an army? Perhaps this is a question that we need to ask ourselves tonight or tomorrow or today or whenever you feel you can ask that question. Is this good ground? Is my heart the kind of ground that God can plant a seed and it'll grow? Is this good ground? According to Jesus, there are four kinds or four types of ground. Seed produces fruit based on the ground that it's planted in. Every seed produces after its own kind. Would you agree? But I want to share a parable with you because it's packed with truth. It's found in Matthew chapter 13. And this is going to be a long passage of scripture. I'm just going to really focus most of our time here. But I want you to track with me and listen and read with me. Let's pray before we read this. Father, we come before you now in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for everyone in the building tonight and everyone that's joined us online. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, tonight that your folks won't hear my words, but they'll hear your heart stray from the throne room of God. So, God, I thank you for it. I thank you that lives will be transformed, will be changed. People will be encouraged. People will have joy for their journey and peace for their pace in life. So, Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. Matthew chapter 13, I'm going to read verses 3 through 23. Not all at one time, so don't get nervous. If you don't uh, have a Bible, if you don't have a device, which you can, you can pull out your device at any time, look on with us, it'll be on the screen. This is out of the New Living Translation, talking about Jesus here. He told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell upon a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. Verse 6. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun. And since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still others fell, still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Verse 10, and his disciples came and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to people? 
Why are you telling stories, Jesus? Why are you always telling these kind of crazy stories? And he replied, you're permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. Others are not. So to those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have, it'll be taken away from them. That is why I use parables. Or they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. Now verse 14. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people, they're hardened. And the ears cannot hear. And they have closed their eyes. So their eyes cannot see and their ears cannot hear. And their hearts cannot understand. And they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. Do you see God's desire? God wants us to have our eyes on him, our ears on him. So we can see him, so we can hear him clearly, so we can understand the truth of his word, so we can receive his love, which is uh, you're never going to fully exhaust God's love, no matter if you live 150 years on this earth. It's always going to be an ongoing transformation, revelation of how important you are to God. The Bible says this is that Christ in you, the hope of glory. So it's one thing for God, God's love to be in you, But it's one thing for you to be so consumed and so saturated with his love that you're now affecting others. And others are getting saved. Other lives are being affected because you are encouraging them. Amen? So that was a long passage of scripture, huh? Man. We're going to unpack it though a little bit more. God wants us to live from a place of wholeness. He wants us to live from a place of being healed and delivered and set free. But the ears of our hearts and our spiritual eyes have to be open to see and hear. So think about that for a second. Verse 16. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. I tell you the truth, many prophets and even righteous people long to see what you see. But they didn't see it. And they longed to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. Can we all make a declaration together as a church family? Can you repeat this after me and put some faith with it? Say, I have eyes to see. And I have ears to hear. And I'm not missing it. Let's just say it again. I have eyes to see. And I have ears to hear. And I'm not going to miss it. Now change it a little bit more. Personalize it. Say, my eyes see and my ears hear all that I need to see and hear. Imagine if we got up and we declared that every single day. That after you have your personal time with the Lord, your devotions, and you pray and you read and you worship. God, I think that today that my eyes are open to see what you need me to see. And Lord, my ears are open to hear what I need to hear. I was talking with a pastor uh, probably about... Maybe two months ago, and we were, he's, uh, he's probably in his 70s, and he was simply saying this to me. He said, you know, I, I, in every conversation, I pray, Lord, let me hear what I need to hear. Someone didn't catch that. Words might be spoken, but let me hear what I need to hear. And don't let me hear what I don't need to hear. Someone might get that at like 3 a.m. Like, oh, that's it. Well, that was a powerful prayer. And I was like, man, I'm writing that one down on on the tablet of my heart. That God, in every conversation, let me hear what I need to hear, regardless of the words that were spoken. Don't let, protect my ears. Don't let me hear the words that are spoken that I don't need to hear. So they don't take root in my heart. That's the whole key is taking root in your heart. Verse 18, now listen to the explanation of this parable about the farmer planting seeds. 
is ground number one is a hard heart or a hardened heart. By the footpath, simply this, well, verse 19, the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom of God and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. So let's talk about it. The footpath. People would make footpaths along the edge of a plowed field or even across it where the seed lies upon a beaten track. So picture a track, picture a rut, and even the seeds go in the rut. So what happens? They just kind of get trampled upon. That ground is packed down. It's compressed. It's hardened. So what's being described here is that, hey, yeah, there's, I come to church and I listen and, and I'm listening to things, but man, my heart, I'm, I'm not really in it. I'm on my phone. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm concerned with the cares of my life. I'm concerned with all these different issues. I don't really want to be here, but it's like, kind of like I feel like I'm checking off a box so I can feel better serving a religious duty. This isn't about a religious duty. This is about a relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I want to encourage you. That's ground number one. Along the footpath, sometimes the sun would just kind of beat down on it. You ever... Here comes Tennessee again. So in Tennessee sometimes, when we were out there, we spent three years in Tennessee, for those that don't know. We'd be in a... There's times in the back field of the dealership that I worked at, it would rain and then like <laughs> we'd have to park these four-wheel drive trucks um, <laughs> in this back area. And let's just say at times I got a little bored. So I would kick it into four-wheel drive and some of these long bed Ford F-350s, I would just kind of have a little bit of fun every now and then. But afterwards, the sun would bake. The sun would just hit it. And that ground would get so hard. And every now and then, someone would trade in a truck. And they'd have these big knobby tires that, like, had tread like that. And they'd be, you know, 1,000 horsepower. They'd soup them up and put chips in them and all kinds of crazy stuff. Like, max out the turbos. And I just lost about half of you right there. And it was awesome. You'd rev, you'd rev that engine. All of a sudden, you see black smoke come out of that tailpipe of that diesel truck. And, man, it was just, it, it was awesome. So one day, I took this on the pavement. And I was like, well, the guy told me what to do. So it had this little dial underneath here. And you turn the dial, one, two, three little clicks. The third click, that was the stuff. The third click, that, there was no holding back that you better know what you're doing. So there was this back road, and behind the dealership was a Walmart. And then this back road had, you know, just the pavement was kind of tore up. And there would be a gravel spot, and then there would be a dirt spot. And then there would be this old pavement that you would kind of have, you know, some ruts from maybe some trucks. Not the kind of truck that I was driving. Maybe from some bulldozers or things like that. So I was like, well, I have to sell this truck or I have to give an accountability for this truck as to its potential, what its capability is. So I would put it in four-wheel drive and I just hit it. I wanted to see what a thousand horsepower felt like. I did, we did, it was amazing. And I just, in case you even had doubt or question in your mind, knobby tires, off-road tires don't belong on street pavement. But in case you ever find yourself in that situation, they will smoke the tires. So that thing just, it, it I mean, this, it, it fishtailed, it went every, but I, even though the knobbies were on there, the pavement still was solid. I couldn't tear up the pavement. I couldn't tear up the ground. I could definitely scatter some rocks and make some smoke. But sometimes in the areas of our life, the ground can be so hard. Maybe someone hurts you. Maybe someone said something. Maybe there's a past that you haven't forgiven yourself about. Don't harden your heart when the word is proclaimed. Because every single day, there's every, every time you hear a message, there's, there's, ski, there's seed being scattered. And that seed is the eternal, incorruptible seed of the word of God. And anything else is great. But if you want to have life transformation and complete transformation and impact your life like never before, 
The Bible says this, is that the word of God, the psalmist right, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Sometimes we walk through some dark places that we need a lamp and a light to help us see what the next step is. You're not required, you know, a lot of people could say, oh, what's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? Sometimes you just need to take the next step and don't worry about the five-year plan. Don't worry about the two-year plan or the 10-year plan. Just take the next right step for you. Amen? So I want to encourage you, check your heart. Check your heart. Make sure your heart isn't hardened. Satan will always try to steal the word of God from you. The second ground type is a shallow heart. And listen to this, verse 20. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. Oh, that was awesome. Wasn't that a good word? That was so cool. Oh, that was lit. That was fire. What was it about? I don't know. Maybe it was filled with more emotion than scripture. Okay, we can talk about that later. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. See, what happens is that you hear a message. Maybe you get excited. Maybe we get excited. Oh, that was awesome. Maybe pick your favorite TV preacher. That was amazing. And let me put it on Instagram. Let me put it on social. Let me go ahead and just, maybe you get so excited about being an echo that instead if you allow the word of God to take root in your life, you could be a voice. Some of you are set on to be an echo when you should be a voice. But you have to allow the word of God to take root in your heart so that you can be. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be an echo. I don't want to say something that somebody else said. I want to say what Jesus said so he can live through me and work through me so we can see the goodness of God in the land of the living. That was awesome. So people receive the word eagerly and even show the first signs of growth, excitement, expectation. But they allow the word just to penetrate just below the surface. But as soon as the heat comes, as soon as the pressure comes or persecution tries to come in, their response to the word is scorched. The heat of life gets stirred up, the temperature rises, and it's hard. Life is hard sometimes. But you know what? God's always there. The Bible says that he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So even in the tough times, even in the, the not so fun times, even where you can't see the next step, that's when you can declare, I have eyes to see and ears to hear. That I see and I know what to do. I know when to do it and I know how to do it. The word doesn't take root. If there's no roots, there's no fruit. And that's what Jesus wants for our lives is that we live a life filled with fruit. But in order to have fruit, there has to be roots, right? So being planted involves a few things. First and foremost, are you planted in the promises of God? God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm reading prophecies now from 25 years ago, 30 years ago coming to pass today so God's word was delivered then imagine the people that waited oh, that could happen tomorrow with expectation not everything's about a prophetic word I'm just kind of giving that instance there but sometimes when it comes to the prophetic the longer it takes for a prophetic word to come to pass the more meaningful it is why? Because it's tested, it's tried, it's true. We're standing faithful. We're doing the, the things that God has called us to do, waiting eagerly. Is today the day? Maybe you received a word from the Lord when Dr. Barala was here. I want to encourage you. Don't just, don't just take my word for it. Don't just take Rachel's word for it. Or don't just take her word for it. Say, God, is this you? Every word that you that you get every prophetic word. I'm, we're not led by the prophetic. You're led by the Spirit of God that lives on the inside of you that will immediately tell you, no, oh, that's wrong or something's off or that's not quite or yes, that is, even though it scares you. New Testament prophecy always confirms 
and affirms what God's already doing in your heart. You might not have the big picture, but you're like, yeah, that's right, man. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I wish that wasn't right, but I know that it is. And God will give you the details to walk it out. The first thing you have to do is agree with it. Just like you have to agree with the word of God. That either Jesus paid a price for you to be saved, to be healed, to be set free, to be delivered, to walk in victory. Remember, you're not fighting to get the victory. You're fighting from a place of victory, enforcing it in your life. Remember that. But the word of God has to be planted in your heart. And sometimes, as you're focusing on God's word, as you're planted in his promises, that has to do with your relationship with him. You have to trust in God. That's the beginning place of faith. It's God, I just trust you. You've done it for this person. You've done it for this person. You haven't done anything in my life per se yet. So that's when you look at someone else's life. And say, God, if you can do it for them, my Bible says that you're not a respecter of persons. So I'm going to trust you with this big issue. It might be the very first time in your life you're taking that step. That's a vulnerable place. I've been there. It, can, it comes to a, a, a point in your relationship with Jesus that you're no longer, it's no longer for, for some of the, the young adults here, for some of the, the students here, it's no longer your parents' relationship with the Lord. That's where the rubber hits the road is that it's your relationship with Jesus now. What can you believe God for? I'm not going to ride on my parents, you know, coattails forever. No, now's when the rubber hits the road is that here's what the Bible says about me. Who I am in Christ, but also who Christ is in me. Many believers are still struggling with who we are in Christ, but it is who Christ is in you. We'll get into that at another time. But it's important that God's word is planted in your heart. It's important that you're planted in a strong local church that preaches the word and operates in the power of the Holy Spirit. If the church isn't preaching the Holy Spirit, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, then it's just going to be a dry church filled with do's and don'ts. The Holy Spirit produces the power. He's the power supply. And it's not mystical, it's not fruity, it's not nutty. No, the Holy Spirit it wants to operate in our lives all the time. Some people just relinquish him to a service if he's allowed in the building. But here at CC, we, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to have place in this church, in our lives. That every day that, Lord, let your voice, Holy Spirit, become louder and louder. Let your voice become the loudest in the crowd. But that takes time getting on your face before the Lord and say, Lord, what do you have? Start your day out, finish your day out. Whatever works best for you, do both. I know there's times and seasons that maybe you get up early in the morning and other times it's, maybe it's late at night. As long as you're doing something. It doesn't have to be for hours. No, just take five minutes, take ten minutes, take, keep building. And as you're building in your relationship with the Lord, just say, God, I trust you that I'm hearing from heaven. Show me what this scripture means because I don't have a clue. He's okay if you're honest with him like that. He actually prefers that. But this week, we're beginning our fall semester in small groups, and I want to encourage you is that there's times in our lives where we all need help. We want people to encourage us, to help us grow, to mentor us, to coach us. I want to encourage you, get in a small group. We all have blind spots, things that we don't see in our lives. I want to encourage you, get around other people. Let them encourage you. Let them speak life into you. Let's grow together as a church family. Commit to a small group be part of it. Psalms chapter 92 verse 13. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of the Lord. There's another version, another translation I believe it's the Holman and it simply says this, he who is planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish and thrive. Doesn't that sound good? Why? Why is it important? Why would I flourish and thrive here instead of outside the four walls of the church? There's things to do outside the four walls of the church, and there's a lot of work to do. But when you're in here, when you're in the church, when you're part of a church family, you will flourish and thrive because it's, it's faith multiplied. 
It's testimonies. It's demonstration multiplied. Your faith, your faith, your faith, your testimony, what God did in your heart, what God did years ago, what God did today, what God did last week, it's multiplied and it's an encouragement for us all because there's a corporate anointing, there's a corporate faith, there's a corporate supply that encourages us all. That's what we experienced last week. Those services were amazing and uh, you know, the Lord spoke some things personally to us and into the very fabric and the foundation of this church. And um, there are some exciting days coming down the pike, and we're, we're honored to be part of that. We're honored that you guys are part of that. But good things lie out ahead. But I want to share this with you, back to the ground type too. Seeds sown in stony places where there was thin or the, so- or the soil was thin means simply this, is that you might know the basics, but you just stay there. And it's okay, no one, to be part of this church, you don't have to do anything else. You're always going to be encouraged to grow, to, na- to take the next step, to grow in your relationship with God, to not stay the same. Why? Because God always has more for you. He has more for you. It's not just a salvation experience. It can be if that's all that you want, but I want to get all that God has for me. I want to receive all that He has for me. I want to receive all the benefits, all the goodness of God. I want to receive all the wisdom from heaven that we can so that we can be a light and a witness and a testimony to this community and then wherever he leads us from here. Amen? Ground type number three is a crowded heart. A crowded heart. Verse 22, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life in the lure of wealth. So no fruit is produced. Seeds sown among thorns, where thorns and weeds choke out the good seed. In other words, you receive it. That means that you know about the truth. We know the truth. We're so wrapped up with the worldly things and and my job, and, 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 and this person, and that person, and maybe we're not living godly lives like maybe we should be. Thorns are the cares of this world, and there's a lot of cares right now, and every day it seems like they're multiplying. I get that. And sometimes life just seems hard. But life's a whole lot harder without Jesus, amen? And that you have a hope, you have a way. You just can't be focusing just only, I want to encourage you, don't be focusing on the on the hard places, over the, the stuff, over the, the issues, over the problems, because problems are always going to be there. But this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith, our faith in Jesus, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you, and it doesn't always have to be problems that chokes things out. It doesn't have to be just worries and fears and how to pay the bills and how to get the kids to college or work or life. It can be other things. It can be, hey, I'm just crowded by always trying to chase the dollar. Things are good in my life now, but I want more money, more money, more money. Show me the money. So that's what you're pursuing. Check your heart. Is money your God? Are things your God? Don't crowd out the seed so that there's no room, the seed of God's word, so that there's no room for it in your life. We all live busy lives. But check your heart. Check your ground. Are you good ground? It's easy for us to let our hearts get crowded and let the the word of God get choked out. And just even being busy, even just being busy doing things for him. That's where it gets complicated sometimes. Oh, I'm so busy. You're so busy doing things for him that you're not reading the word. You're not your fellowship time, your hangout time, your quality time with God, your worship time. And maybe where it wasn't or maybe where it shouldn't be. Stay consistent in your relationship with Jesus. Stay in the word. Maybe, wow. Maybe um, just like the prophetic words, maybe you're seeing someone's winning season or someone's getting what they've been believing God for. You're seeing, oh, wow, all this is happening. All this amazing stuff's happening for this person. Don't get jealous of someone else's winning season. Stay consistent, stay steady, stay in the word. Because your winning season's next. You want a prophetic word? There it is. 
your winning season is next. Don't get jealous. Don't get sidetracked by, oh, look at all those. Oh, that's awesome. But what about me? And you're trying to cheer. You're trying to do the best you can. But what about me? You're next. You're one day away. What a difference a day makes. What a difference a week can make in your life when you're staying steady on the promises of God. When you're good soil, when you have a good heart, where you're doing all the right things. The Bible says that we will reap if we faint not. Amen? So if someone's in a winning season, man, I'd bump up beside them and be like, what up? Celebrate with them. Rub some of that celebration, some of that win on me. Give them a high five. Man, I know, I know. It's awesome. I know what I see. But I'm, I know there's also some, some struggles you might have gone through in a previous season, some things that you had to do, some things you had to fight for in order to win, to be on this side, which is the winning side. We all have seasons in life. So let's make sure that if, uh, if you're not in a winning season, find someone who is so you can celebrate with them and be encouraged. Ground type number four, a fruitful heart, good ground. Oh, come on, somebody. Verse 23, the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as they planted. But seed sown on good ground in our lives is when we are planted firmly in God's truth. I believe here at Christ Chapel, man, every single one of you are good ground. You're type number four. You're one in four. You're the one in, we can look, but simply it's a mathematical equation. One in four people. Someone said this to Rachel and I. <laughs> uh, we're, we have some, some mentors. And they're like, one in four people get it. And we're looking for the Barna study, looking for all this amazing stuff. Look, oh, who said that? Jesus. Looking for the stats, looking for the stuff, looking for the notes. Where's the article? I want to hear the podcast. Just read your Bible. One in four, get it. Rachel was reading it and she told me and I was like, oh, light bulb. One in four people get it. I believe that we have a church filled with force, good ground, good hearts, good people, ready to receive all the promises of God. And regardless of what they've seen in the past, no, you're good ground. You're a four. You're a one in four. You're the difference maker. You defy the odds because of God's word. This is where we all need to be on a continual basis. Allow God's word to take root. Your heart is the ground. If you imagine each type of soil is the person's heart. According to the math stats, 25% of the seed sown will reach its full potential. How much more seed do we need to be sowing? Always getting the word. That's why it's important to get the word out there to be but how much more for us as leaders with giftings and callings in this room and potential and destiny and purpose? How many people do we come across on a daily basis that we need to sow seeds of God's word in their lives, seeds of hope, seeds of encouragement, seeds of life and not death? I believe everyone here I believe in you. I believe you're good. I believe that we all have fights, we all have struggles, but we have to fight the headspace in between. And that's the voice of Satan that try to come in and be like, oh, no, that's not you. No, you're, no, it works for everyone else but you. You take authority over those thoughts. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to see the faithfulness of God because we're good ground. We have good hearts. We have eyes to see, ears to hear. And then what the Ephesians prayer says, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. That the eyes of my understanding, that they're enlightened. That I may know the hope 
of his calling. Where are the riches of the glorious inheritance in the saints toward us who believe? Does anybody here believe? Just like the working of his mighty power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. That's the platform for how we live our lives. But every day you got to pray the prayer. Lord, I thank you that I have wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, that my eyes are open, that I have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand your word, a heart to understand the times that we're living in, a heart to understand what I'm going through right now, because where I'm at right now, as, as, as permanent as, as it might feel, as uh, unstable as it might seem, oh, I thank you that tomorrow it can change. What a difference a day makes, especially for those in the household of faith. Are you standing on the promises of God? Are you good ground? How do you cultivate a good heart? So that the when the seeds of God's words planted, that they cultivate and they 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 we reap a harvest off of those. And you reap a harvest. If you want deep roots and good fruit, here's what you need to do keep your heart with all diligence. Why? Because out of it flows the issues of life. Here's the big one. Are you ready for it? I wanted to say all of that to get to this point. Gosh. I've been in this place before. I've been in church faithfully week after week. I've been serving and sacrificing. But then there's something that can happen. You can get your eyes off the wrong thing. Get your eyes on the wrong thing. You can get offended. Offense has robbed so many people of their purpose and their destiny and the blessing of God and the peace of God in their lives. Sometimes some of the biggest things that you're looking for, the very thing that you're looking for, you're, you can't see, and it's right out in front of you because you're blinded by offense. Offense is a blessing blocker. It pollutes your heart. It clouds your judgment. It can cause crazy. It can derail you from your destiny. So I want to encourage you, keep your heart. Keep it, tend to it. How do you do that? And you just have these quiet times, and sometimes you just got to sit down and stop the noise, push pause on the YouTube, get off of TikTok, whatever your thing is. Don't get nervous, I'm just sitting here quietly. I'm leading by example. This is what you need to do in your life. Lord, is there anything in me that's not pleasing to you? Lord, I want to be with clean hands and a pure heart. Lord, is there anything that doesn't honor you in my life? Lord, are there any blessing blockers in my life right now? Lord, I don't care about I don't care about the stuff. I don't care about anything else. See, every day is a day closer to eternity. And there's gonna come a moment in your life where you're gonna breathe your last on this earth. And it's gonna be your first in eternity. you breathe your last here on this earth, it doesn't mean that you cease to exist. No, no. The Bible is really clear. And so you go to one of two places, either heaven or hell. For those that have a relationship with Jesus, my, my, my. You're not off the hook yet. See, someday we're going to stand before the Lord. It's called the Burma seat, the reward seat of Christ. And we're going to give an account for our lives. Were you obedient to what I told you to do? I have a healthy fear of that moment in my life as a pastor. It's different for you. But for me, Lord, did I say it right? Did I, did I respond? Did I show it? Did I demonstrate it like I should have? 
I'm accountable for every word, every action. And I'm living for the moment I stand before my Savior. Because my heart's desire is I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Not just, hey, all right, you believed in Jesus, that's awesome. You led a few people to the Lord. Oh, you even prayed with some people and they got healed and delivered and set free. And I want to go beyond that. I want to lead people to their purpose and to their destiny. I know many other leaders in this room want to do the same thing. The first step in a destiny moment is this. If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if you've never said, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross just for me, I ask you to come into my heart and to be my Lord, my Savior. That's the starting place. And here's why. For some, that moment's coming sooner than later. You're going to breathe your last. Eternity is forever in two places, one of two places, heaven or hell. By default, we're all going to hell. We're all born and built with the eternity in our hearts. You might say, I've gone to church my whole life, man. That's awesome. So have an I. But there comes a moment in your life where you have to make a decision for yourself. Just because you go to church doesn't mean that you're a Christian. Doesn't mean that you're a follower of Jesus. Well, I've gone to church and I've been a good person. Congratulations. I believe in being a good person. I believe in doing the right thing. I believe in being a person of character and integrity. But the Bible says that it doesn't say that good people go to heaven. It says that forgiven people do. So if you're here today, maybe you you don't know Jesus whether in the building or online. If you want to make a decision right now, you want to receive him as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask us all just to repeat this prayer after me. And as you do, I'm going to ask those that are praying this prayer, whether you're rededicating your life or whether you're praying for the first time, I'm going to ask you to mix some faith with it. Faith is a belief and a trust that what you're saying, that Jesus is the Son of God, that God watches over you, and that God does love you. Can we pray that prayer together? For those that know Jesus, let's all pray this prayer and encourage the others here today as they receive Jesus. Say, dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross just for me. I ask you to come into my heart, to be my Lord, to be my Savior. Jesus, I ask you, that from this moment forward you would help me to live a life that honors and pleases you. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's give these people a great big hand. A couple of quick steps for you. So if you prayed that prayer for the first time or maybe you should have or maybe it's the second or third time that you prayed this prayer. I want to encourage you to tell somebody. It's important to tell someone because As we shared earlier, when you leave here, you might do something that you used to do before you made a decision for Jesus. The devil's going to come and say, there was no change in your life. You're still the same old person. You're still messed up and blah, blah, blah. No, tell someone because you are saved. You are what the Bible calls born again. But you need to tell someone because you need to be encouraged in your walk with the Lord. If you don't have a Bible, our church family would love to buy you a Bible, love to give you a Bible, and uh, let us know. I think it's important to definitely have a Bible. I have, I love you know, technology, devices, but I love looking at the Word of God and just seeing. There's something about laying your eyes on a piece of paper. I know I'm a little bit more old school, but I love that. I want to encourage you this. If you don't have a local church, you'd like to say, welcome home, welcome to Christ Chapel. When you're here, you're family. And lastly, I want to encourage you, everyone in this room, um, become part of a small group. There's several out there to choose from. That's how we grow. That's the next level of discipleship and relationship here at Christ Chapel. And it's important. I'm excited about this next group. So definitely check them all out. Register online. We have some great ones coming up. Um, It's going to be a powerful time. We're going to keep growing in the Lord, right? How many are going to be good grass? I purpose in my heart. 
purpose in my life to be that good ground, to be the 25%, to be the one, to be the number four, four ground, good ground, good soil. That every time I hear the word of God, that it produces good seed. It produces a harvest. It produces what God intends for it. Amen? Let's all stand to our feet. Let's pray. We'll be dismissed. Well, Father, we come before you now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this time together. Lord, I thank you that your word takes root in every single heart. Lord, you see every heart, every home, every desire. Lord, I pray right now that as they leave here tonight, we call every home blessed. We call every desire fulfilled. God, I pray that you be with each one, that you protect them. Lord, I thank you that ministering angels watch over each one and keep them safe. Lord, even this week with the pending storm. God, I thank you for it. I thank you you watch over them. But I thank you, Lord, that as they grow in their relationship with God, that, Lord, that you would show them things to come. So we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. We love you, and we'll see you real soon.